<laughs> All right, I think I'm ready here. Karen? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm ready to go. Are you ready? We're ready. Let's rock. All right, here we go. Welcome to Food Freedom Radio, where we plant the seeds of change. I'm Karen Olson Johnson. Laura Hedlund will be back with us next week. And we have a most interesting conversation today that is relevant and relevant to everybody's lives. And I mean absolutely everybody, because we're talking about hunger. And I think if you think about the people that you know, those people that are in your immediate circle and those people that are in the wider circle of the Twin Cities and the wider circle of this state and the United States, you know people who are hungry and people who have been hungry. And this remains an issue and remains a concern for so many There is a most wonderful organization right here in the Twin Cities that's been working on hunger for a long time, Second Harvest Heartland. And joining me in studio today is Rob Zeske, who is the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland. And we're going to be talking about some really important goals, some things that are coming up and some things that are are remarkable that this organization has, has done and is trying to do. So if you haven't heard about Second Harvest Heartland, and if you're wondering about hunger and how much of an issue that is and and what's to be done about it, this is the show to listen to. And we're right on that corner, right on the edge of moving into spring, I think, in Minnesota, that renewal time. And I, I can't tell you how exciting it was to be at Second Harvest and to um, – Marsha took me along, took me around that, that complex, and boy, were my eyes opened. So let's talk a little bit – welcome first to the show, Rob. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you. And, you know – Second Harvest Heartland and childhood hunger and hunger in general. You know, I, I kind of thought that, you know, we've, we've made great progress. Hunger's basically done, isn't it? <laughs> that, you know, it, it sure seems like it should be, right? In, uh, in 2018, in the breadbasket of the world's wealthiest nation right here in Minnesota, I keep uh, calling the Twin Cities the Silicon Valley of food, right? With all of the resources we have around the food and the agricultural economy, it seems like it should be something of the past. But, uh, you know, we have seen numbers steadily climb in terms of utilization uh, since the recession. We have a number of people that were hit in 2008, 2009. Those were seniors who were either at or approaching retirement, whose nest eggs were devastated. Uh, We've got people who have never fully recovered either their hours nor their wages uh, after coming out of 2008-9 recession time. And uh, and that's carried through. So we are still seeing record number of uh, of visits to food shops. Uh, We have a near high utilization of uh, things like food stamps. Uh, And so it is right here. But I agree with you. It is uh, challenging sometimes to think about why uh, and why in this day and age we have it right here in uh, in a city uh, and state and country as affluent and with as much abundance as, as ours. Is the is the statistic about childhood hunger? What is it? One in in how many right now? One in six kids. Uh, and One uh, in six one kids. One in six children in Minnesota has, is dealing with food insecurity. And food insecurity is a USDA, a technical term, uh, which deals with the issue of hunger. That means kids are making choices to uh, not always have the foods that they want to be able to have, not access to nutritious foods, because they're having to make uh, choices or their families are having to make choices. I think the tough thing for me about the uh, – two tough things, but about the, the childhood numbers in, in Minnesota are – one in 10 Minnesotans is struggling with hunger, but one in six kids. So it is disproportionately affecting our children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, too, as we all understand and we think about uh, the, the hunger, at least in part, as a issue of human potential, of our humanity and dignity, uh, it's, it's shocking that we have a disproportionately high number of those kids within our population that are struggling to find food. Because if you're a kid and you're struggling to find food, okay, you can't find food, what are the implications of that? Yeah, great question. We we did an interview uh, last year with uh, with several educators in several schools that we that we have programs with, uh, and I'll never forget this conversation with Miss Vicky, who works in a kindergarten class in Frogtown uh, in St. Paul, who um, 
who basically said, look, some of my kids are in survival mode. Right? Survival they mode? They come in in the mornings or the weekends, and they are they're asking for food. They may not have, have eaten. They have siblings who are still at home who have not, uh, who have not eaten. And this is, you know, this is devastating to a child's growth and development path. And so there's several things that, you know, instantly I think the issue of just staying healthy if you can't find the right kinds of food is, is hugely important. But I think as we all understand, when that is our number one concern, uh, it, it, it pushes all the other things out. I had uh, my, my predecessor at Second Harvest Heartland had a great quote, which said, you know, we all, we all have problems. Uh, but if you're hungry, you have one problem. Yeah, uh, and that is that motivating drive for kids, adults, seniors, whoever. We every day need to feed ourselves, and that can become our overriding purpose, mission, activity. If we're if we're not able to find the right kinds of foods, well, and if you can't eat, you know those basic survival, those root needs, right? That's crisis time, you know, and that that brings forth you know all kinds of other energies that could be targeted to you know, education that could be targeted to, you know, all of these other things that are yeah. that are not having the attention paid to them simply because you can't eat. Yep, that, that's right. And I came to this issue of hunger uh, most recently from work in early education. And, you know, we know about the challenges of, of brain development, child development by the time they're five and earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I think about this issue of food as certainly being uh, a contributor to the challenges of, of inequities we see in, in terms of uh, learning and, and growth. But, um, but you know, that's a, that's a critical part, making sure these kids have uh, the building blocks to be able to grow. We, there's one great research paper that we often cite, which uh, the, the reporter said, uh, look, trying to, trying to uh, feed or trying to Put money into education for kids that are hungry is like trying to fill up a leaky bucket, right? It's it's just something that we'll never be able to fully achieve for those kids uh, if they're not equipped with the building blocks that includes food, shelter, uh, and, and those basic issues of, of, of needs. Feeling safe, okay? F you know, having those things so that you feel secure enough, safe, safe enough so that when you go into an environment and you want to learn, those other things aren't just floating around in the back of your head. So I know because of my visit when I was there, actually when I was at at Second Harvest um, to talk with you, there was this lovely woman at the at the front desk, and a senior citizen had come in. Um, they had been there to pick up their box, and they knew that they got some other supplemental box, but they had missed getting it that day before. And they were like, okay, I'm back because I need that supplemental. Oh, those people at that front desk. You know, I just want to I mean, I, it, it chokes me up now to think about how compassionate, compassionately they dealt with that woman and said, okay, you know, we're going to get you that box. And you guys are so organized. You knew that she hadn't been there and picked up that box. So it's, it's kids, yes, but the other side of that is our seniors. Yeah, we, and you know what? I guess on that note, too, we are, we are so fortunate to be part of a, of a huge network, right? We're one organization in a network in our community of local compassionate, engaged organizations that are working with our neighbors directly with the same kind of humanity that you witnessed at our place. And, and so we see that every day. And I mm -hmm. tell you, that is uh, that is part of what fuels me with a ton of optimism and hope is watching mm -hmm. our neighbors do the right things for each other. Um, but you're right. It's not just kids, right? It is, uh, it is the families and it is seniors. And we have, you know, when we think about our most vulnerable communities right now, we think about kids. We think about our seniors. We also think about some of our uh, really important new American and cultural groups that are being underserved in, mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. But certainly uh, for the seniors, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the conversation, we have so many people, A, who are going to be uh, headed to becoming seniors, right, becoming retirees. But we also know that a lot of those that have been facing that uh, are facing it with decreased prospects of, of what their retirement looked like because of the recession. It yeah, was just yeah. late in their careers and late in, in their saving. Uh, and if they weren't prepared, they, they're in real trouble. And so we're seeing that over and over again. And that's a group that we're going to have to continue to prepare for as we think about this so-called silver tsunami uh, <laughs> that is headed our way. Uh, sitting right here. Um, so, and then I witnessed, in, um, speaking of diversity, I witnessed in the back end of the building where um, people come in from other organizations that have their own food shelves in the communities, in their neighborhoods, and they come in 
to second harvest to pick up. Can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah. You know, traditionally, Second Harvest Heartland has been uh, a wholesaler. So we're a food bank, and we yeah. support local food shelves. And so those are the, the corner pantries. Those are the, the grocery store-like programs uh, that are across Minnesota, across our communities. And so uh, Second Harvest Heartland is a distributor to uh, to them. We serve about 1,000 local food shelves. 1,000? Yeah, meal Whoa. programs. And those are homeless shelters as well. So uh, on average, when we think about uh, in our service, area, the food shelves, on average, about 75% of the food that they distribute comes from Second Harvest Heartland. And our job has been to aggregate that food traditionally from large consumer packaged goods companies like General Mills. Uh, but in the last several years since the recession, that has really changed and grown to include not only consumer packaged goods, but places like grocery stores. So we work with over 400 grocery stores, every Lunds and Byerly's, every Target, every Cub, every Sands Club, every Coburn's in our service area, huge numbers of partners. Um, and from there, those partnerships, we've actually gone to growers as well. So uh, we are... are, are very focused on making sure that we efficiently source that food from in large quantities, get that broken down with an army of volunteers, and make sure we get it to these local partners. And some of them are big, are big social service organizations, and others are in church basements in western Minnesota, First mm-hmm. Lutheran Church, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so making sure that we get those to every part of the the system that needs it is our is our job and so we have dist- we've built a pretty sophisticated distribution functionality but also know that we've got partners and what you were alluding to is where we have people who may be cooking a meal for a group home that are coming in to cook that night so they will stop in they will see what we have rather than us delivering a semi load of, mm-hmm. of product they are picking and choosing from uh, the fresh and shelf stable ingredients we have at that moment cooking for our neighbors literally that night Literally that night. That was just, I mean, because the the plethora of different threads of different things that Second Harvest does is just, I mean, it is, to wrap your brain around it is absolutely incredible. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about is this effort going forward, this legislative effort in the omnibus bill, because Second Harvest needs our attention and our, by I mean our listeners' attention about what the effort is that you're trying to do and, and this building that you'd like to build because the need is there, right? And we need to expand to meet the need. So when we come back from break, we're going to continue the conversation about this this wonderful effort that Second Harvest is, is undergoing now. You're listening to Food Freedom Radio on AM 950. All right. Bam. So we'll have to cut the second segment a little short. So Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to think in terms of segments. Sorry about that. So. <laughs> um, okay, so let's come back because I think, you know, we set the, we obviously set yep. this. So let's come back about this bonding bill, what this bonding bill is, why Brooklyn Park, you know, blah, yep. blah, blah, yep. you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we're, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, yep. we're ready whenever you are, Brett. Okay. All right, here we go. So a little bit shorter, but not too much. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to Food Freedom Radio, where we plant the seeds of change. I'm Karen Olson-Johnson. Laura will be back next week. I'm with Rob Zesky, who's the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland. And when he went to break, we were talking about this exciting news. Um... We have an opportunity now in this legislative session to do something huge to address hunger in this area. And and part of it has to do with this bonding bill that's coming up and this project that Second Harvest is, is trying to get our support for. So, Rob, okay, what are you guys trying to do? <laughs> We are in desperate need of a new building, <laughs> and, yeah. and to put it in a, to put it mildly, so we're in our current uh, location in uh, in Maplewood, which we've been for over thirty years. So thirty uh, years, yeah. Wow. So so Second Harvest Heartland was the product of the merger of the Minneapolis and the St. Paul food banks in two thousand and one, but our current location was the original St. Paul food bank, which was uh, purchased in nineteen eighty five. We believe uh, we've been in that location ever since. In those first couple years, to our best of the understanding based on annual reports from that time, was that building distributed about 2 million pounds of food out of it in 1985. This year, we're on pace to distribute 100 million pounds (gasps) out of that building. 
Uh, that so same building. Same building. And, and I was there. You are busting at the seams. And the lot. Oh, anyway, go ahead. I'm we, sorry. We are <laughs> so fortunate to have great corporate partners who yeah. have, you know, given their time, skilled volunteering over the years to help us uh, find more and more space. But as of the last uh, super value support that we got uh, about eight years ago, we have really used about every cubic foot of space that we have in that facility. And we're landlocked. There's no place else for this to go. And so uh, as we look at opportunities, and our, our, our challenges, uh, first, there's a number of things that we can't do. We're, mm -hmm. we're literally not able to take some sources of food right now. We have demand for programs like backpack programs where we have schools, community groups that will set up for low-income kids in schools during the school year a weekend meal program where on Friday night they'll give a backpack at the end of the day and those kids will get six meals worth of food that are child-appropriate, don't require you know refrigeration or boxing. I mean, just easy to use meals. Um, we struggle to be able to support those programs right now because we don't have the space to mm -hmm. order at the mm -hmm. truckload level. The, you don't have the space, but the need is there. Absolutely, yeah. and the demand of the funding is there. Mm -hmm. We we can't take bananas right now. So bananas require special refrigeration, and we have opportunities for those. So when we think about the perishable foods that we have, that's another example. Another, oh, I was in your refrigerator. Hello. It's like floor to ceiling. Where are they going to put this? It yeah. fills up every night with the food that we get from grocery store donations and then it's out the next morning. We have to move that very quickly. And so mm -hmm. those are real limitations in our ability to meet people where they are in our community. So that's one part. I think the second part for us is around food safety. Uh, our food has gotten increasingly fresh, which is wonderful in terms of the nutritional content for our food. This year, over 60% of the food we distribute will be fresh. <gasps> I think so, you need to say that again. How much is fresh? 60% will be fresh. And that is a radical change from mm -hmm. when I started and certainly from the beginning of this building when it was all boxes and cans. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so our focus as we think about how we meet the needs and particularly how we put additional resources to work. And if we think about what's, what's available in our world and our state and our community, we have a huge amount of access to perishable foods. And so uh, the USDA estimates that in Minnesota, on an average year, we plant but don't harvest or harvest but don't sell. So the stuff we put in the ground but never makes it to market of about 200 million pounds of food a year. Okay, so, so you're touching upon food waste. You know, and that the the fact that it's planted, but it never ends up somewhere. That's I mean, and you're trying to fill this gap by this you you new facility, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so yeah. So that does bring us back to the new facility. I think what we're, what I was pointing out was there's a tremendous amount of opportunity when we have one in six kids, one in ten adults in Minnesota struggling to find food, and we have 200 million pounds of food. We need a bigger funnel. Uh, and so Second Harvest Heartland has outgrown everybody from the corporate sector in the distribution world, from our own Feeding America National Network, has looked at us and said, we ha we, this has been the little engine that could. And so we <laughs> have uh, we have purchased uh, a new facility in Brooklyn Park that will be our new home. And uh, we are in the middle of a capital campaign, so we are seeking $18 million from the state of Minnesota and general obligation bonds to help support this project. We are showing up with a $2 to $1 match. So it's a roughly $50 million campaign. So every dollar the state puts in, we will put in $2. So you're not asking the state for everything. Oh, you say, no, okay, no. okay. And, and I think the real magic, as we've told the state, as we've testified for, for our work is, you know, in addition to the food component, uh, we will be matching their $18 million every year with $125 million worth of public support. See, I think, all right, every year, $125 million of public support, and, and you're asking the state for an $18 million investment. We think this is a home run. Yeah, and we've asked, yeah. uh, when we testified, uh -huh. we've asked for, you know, the leaders, if they could show us something that has higher leverage with community dollars and support, uh -huh. we'd love to see it. But that $125 million is what we get every year from individual donors, right? We have a, last year we received $87,000, sorry, 87,000 gifts. Uh, the median size of that was $47. So oh. these are people who give us $20 gifts mm -hmm. and $30 gifts and $8 gifts. Uh, and we can't build a new building on gifts like that. We mm -hmm. need the state support and, mm -hmm. and need significant support to be able to move forward with, with confidence. Um, but those gifts, it is the in-kind food that we get from grocery stores, from growers, from, uh, from food drives that we receive. 
All of that adds up to $125 million of support that our community pours into us as a conduit for our neighbors. And so we, uh, we think that is an absolute winning proposition and doesn't even include the estimated 50,000 volunteers a year uh, that will give us 150,000 hours of time to help us move this food. So it's not just about the logistics of that. It's also about engaging the hearts and minds of our community in this in this huge leverage point for, for compassion and empathy that we're yeah. going to be able to export throughout the state. This is a classic, when we all do better, we all do better. Right? So true. And so this, so this is a bonding bill right now. And so we're going to, to make this really clear. This is one of the things that our listeners can do because this is in front of your representatives right now in the state of Minnesota. Second Harvest Heartland is asking for $18 million in this bonding bill, this omnibus bill, in order to help fund this new facility facility in Brooklyn Park. It's about that simple, right? Absolutely. Okay. We think, based on the support that we've gotten, that our organization and this work should be a model for what public-private government partnership looks like. We're doing a lot of the work that the state cares about. Almost all of that is with private donations, right? Is with personal support. <laughs> yeah. But we need help now. This is one that is uh, is not only important that we get state support given the size of our typical do- donation, uh, and uh, and we have some urgency around this. We have urgency, yeah, because you're busting at the seams where you are in Maplewood, and you want to expand over on the other side, and then, you know, and and bring some of these programs to people who may not be served in that area, right? And then expand the services, period. Absolutely. Yeah. Those are those are pieces of the urgency. The other part of the urgency is what does it mean this year for kids not to be able to get the meals they need, right? Yeah. What does it mean this year for seniors? Um, we wonder what does it mean this year for people who are choosing between food and medical, m- medical attention for the diabetes costs that we're all going to be paying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we're talking with Rob Zesky, who's the CEO of Second Harvest. Now, we're going to continue the conversation conversation about this new facility, the volunteers, the produce, the efficiency, and the strategic priorities of Second Harvest when we come back from break. From break. This is Food Freedom Radio on AM 950. Friday night arrives without a suit. the 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 good all right sounds good let me get your mics back on here all right okay here we go try to see it my way do I have to keep on talking till I can go that's good. Do I have to keep on talking till I can't go? On? <laughs> I know we're we're joined by Rob Zesky, um, the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland, and I know you've been spending a lot of time at the Capitol um, talking until you can't go on anymore. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. So true. Because <laughs> we're you know the the focus of this show is really about Second Harvest Heartland and and the issues of hunger. But in particular about this bonding bill, um, and we are rapidly um, you know, rolling up on that May 21st legislative deadline. So we do want to make sure that our listeners understand that this is incredibly important for you to make these phone calls to your your uh, representatives. You know, what else can our listeners do before we launch back into the, the health impacts about food? What can our listeners do, Rob? 
There's so much, right? I mean, I, between, and not only just for us, but I would say if there are vegetable gardeners, right, our local food shelves and local donations for things like that, food drives, supporting, uh, we just finished the big March drive that was a statewide effort for food shelves, which is which is huge. Volunteering, we have a huge need for people to roll up their sleeves and be arms and legs for us, which is great. And we also are still craving people uh, who are curious about this issue and want to know more and can be ambassadors for, uh, frankly, for getting this solved uh, in, in Minnesota. So I think there's lots of ways. Some of those are available at our website at twoharvest.org. But find your local food shelf or your local meal program and get engaged because a little goes a long way in this issue. And that's that when we all do better, we all do better. Let's connect ourselves and yeah. connect ourselves to the issue somehow. That's right. And then in that connection, you know, figure out where you can fit in. Okay, so the phone calls to the to our um, representatives about this omnibus bill, what should they be saying to their representatives? These are so simple, right? We've done a lot of the work, but uh, the calls are very – I'm meeting with my senator today uh, as well, and so I have not yet met with him. But, uh, you know, it's a simple – I'm calling in support of Second Harvest Heartland's bonding initiative. They need a new facility. It's important to my community and to Minnesota. Will you support it, right? And so that is registering uh, as, a, as a voter, as a citizen, your concern for that topic matters instantly. If you can ask for additional information or ask for support, I think that always helps. But just getting on the radar screen at this point, I think, is really important to make sure senators and, and representatives know that this matters. And this is not just the Twin Cities. This is an 87-county project? That's right. Our food right now touches 87 counties in Minnesota. So in addition to being something that we believe has huge leverage, it, there are not that many truly statewide projects. Our food, uh, we are graded quarterly by our national organization. You're graded. We are. Ooh. I get a quarterly grade, a <laughs> quarterly report, which shows that we... Uh, have distributed our food equitably in the counties that we serve. And so we have to make sure that we distribute food in proportion to the number of food insecure people in every one of the counties we serve, which is really neat. Uh, and that makes, we, we can't just dump all of our food in Hennepin County or Washington County. We have to make sure that the food gets to Lincoln County in proportion to the number of people uh, there. And that's a really neat feature of making sure that this, uh, that this works well and that everybody has access to this food. And it ensures that it's going to go statewide. Okay, so we, when we left for break, we were talking about the, the relationship between food and some health concerns. Can you elaborate some more on that? Yeah, we did a study with the University of Minnesota several years ago and, uh, and asked them to help quantify what the cost of hunger was in Minnesota. There have been some national studies like this, and so we said we want a local look. And the University of Minnesota's Food Industry Center came back and said, uh, we think we spend about $1.6 billion a year. On, on food insecurity. 1.2 billion of that is, is healthcare costs, and about 400 million is educational costs. And so staggering numbers. And so as we think about this project, we're not only talking about kind of the leverage we can amass from the community a, against a, a state investment, it's also what cost can we save the state in, in those, downstream, those downstream expenditures? And so we talked a little bit about education already, but the bigger one and the one that we're seeing some really important uh, progress on is healthcare. And it's really simple and intuitive. Seniors who are hungry spend more time in the hospital. Right? Kids who are hungry spend more time with their pediatrician. People who are struggling to afford the right kinds of foods make the just the totally rational choice to buy cheap calories, mm -hmm. which is typically the on-ramp for type 2 diabetes. And so uh, the, the numbers are staggering uh, for us, but I think suffice it to say, hunger in this country looks like um, people who struggle to find food have this preponderance of other health issues and education issues that we've got to work on. And so we're very actively, especially with all of the produce that we're collecting right now, the fresh foods that I mentioned, working on how do we take a bite out of health care costs uh, for low-income people that are struggling to find food and be part of an answer to this conversation around Medicaid and Medicare costs by injecting wellness. And, and we're convinced that broccoli is cheaper than insulin. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of, we're, we're, and we're, we're amassing a lot of evidence about that as well. But I think so much of that is, uh, is evidence-based, but also really intuitive if you, if you just can't find the right foods. Well, and I, it was, yeah, when I was, fruits and vegetables, you have handouts too that you give to people when they come. All forms matter. This was from March 2018. And it's, and myth busting. Is canned produce, frozen produce less nutritious than fresh? No. 
because these boxes that I, w- I was watching them pack, you know, there was some canned stuff in it too. But then, you know, at the end of it, they were waiting to add in the fresh stuff at the end. And then recipes on the back, you know, for what you have in your box that month, which is, I mean... It's amazing, absolutely amazing what you're doing. Is canned produce filled with sugar and salt? There's a myth, right? No, look for low sodium or no salt added. How can I add more fruits and veggies to my diet? You know, canned fruits and vegetables are heated before they're packaged. You can easily add them to a recipe without any extra work in the kitchen. Put canned peas in a casserole, make a pasta sauce with canned tomatoes. It's So this is kind of... You know, you're, you're trying to hit all those bases, right? Educate the people that are coming to get the food, but then also educate those of us that are out there that don't have to do this, why it's so valuable for everybody else. Yeah, and, and we're trying to make the healthy choice, the easy choice on all of this, right? To make sure that as people walk into a local food pantry and we're all working on getting healthier options there, that people know what to do with them and that they can use them. As you as you said, that we make sure that they're able to uh, put those to work for not just calories, but for a, for a healthy, nutritious diet for their well-being. Yeah, well, and part of it, I mean, I'm going to say too, part of it is that, you know, that whole fast food mentality or buy it in the box or buy it whatever, you know, I think think we're learning, Rob, tell me, I think we're learning that that's not the best food alternative out there. That if you can get a fresh tomato or a can of tomatoes and do something with it, it's a whole lot better than ketchup as a vegetable. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's also just access to those right ingredients, right? I think there's sometimes, and and I'm not a dietitian, so I can't speak to this, but I think what we've certainly believed is, as we think about something like the USDA, my plate guidelines is how can we just fill plates with more fruits and vegetables for that, with dairy, you know, kind of good lean dairy that we're looking for, lean proteins. Those are all the kinds of things that we're investing in getting for our neighbors. Uh, and, and that's for, for all of us, because if our neighbors are healthier, we are healthier as a community. Mm-hmm. All of us are. So the strategic priorities for Second Harvest Heartland going forward, providing more food access. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um Our goal and the goal of the new facility is all about greater food access, more food for more people. The building for us is critical, as we talked about uh, that, to enable both more fruits and vegetables for us to work on, uh, but also just the volunteers to help uh, to help move that through, as well as the space to get those specialty items that I talked about. So that's simple. And I think that kind of the key goal within that is around produce. We distributed roughly 100 million servings of produce last year in our community. We want to double that in the next five years to 200 million. With 5 million people approximately in the state of Minnesota, that's amazing. 100 million servings. That's really amazing. I will tell you, we just finished a survey with General Mills of several thousand of our uh, our clients that we serve. And they told us 60% said that they get all or most of their vegetable servings from food shelves. So let that sink in. That's the driving uh, kind of focus for us is making sure that we can do more for that population that wants healthy foods, that's struggling to get healthy foods, uh, and is telling us that that they're using our healthy foods. In fact, that may be and is the majority of food that they're actually getting in, on the fresh side. And the food that they want. Right. You know, and this, you know, this kind of goes to a, a social justice equity piece, too, that when we're feeding somebody, you know, we don't... In, I'm going to try to ask the phrase this as a question. We don't want to feed them garbage. Why don't we want to feed them garbage? Yeah, and uh, it's a great question. And I think, you know, we have been born as a system which was uh, ab- about um, eliminating waste, right? To be honest, that's the local the local pantry. Let's put it to work. If we've got leftovers, there's there's people starving in, you know, filling, filling your country, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's what my grandmother told me, right? Uh, Clean th- your plate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think increasingly we know that that's not good enough, right? We have to help provide uh, the tools for our neighbors to be able to thrive, not just whatever's left not over. Just and survive, but we thrive. we want to use all of those pieces of abundance that we have in our community, and we do. But we really want to make sure that we're putting those together in a way that's going to help people be healthy. Yeah, that whole survive. Thrive, not just survive, right? But for some people, this really is survival. Like, can you go back to that backpack program, okay? I mean, I just, I'm thinking about it. You know, a kid leaves school on Friday, and in that backpack would be? 
Yeah, so that could be two uh, pop top cans of fruit, right? In uh, in in something like that, it may be packages of some cereal and self- shelf stable milk, a couple apples in uh, in that pack. Uh, we will often have some granola bars, so some snacky things as well. So they really vary, but they're focused on making sure that they provide some well rounded nutrition. So what we can't, you know, apples are great because kids typically love apples; they're a hearty fruit. But those are the kinds of things that we are seeing some really in you know, kind of ingenious partnerships where people are filling the gaps with things like that. And we want to be able to be there and support them. I wonder what a teacher would say when that kid comes back on a Monday morning versus the kid that didn't have something like that. You're a former educator, so (laughs) am I, you know. Yeah, and the teachers love it, right, just like the parents do. And and I will say, you know, we've talked a lot about the kids, but I can't tell you the number of moms, dads, caregivers that I've spoken with who are making excruciating choices, trying to do the right things for their kids, right? Uh-huh. And it's uh, when it comes to those choices, they're making sure their kids can eat um, before they do. Uh, and and so just anyway, that's another been a myth busting uh, piece of this for me too. There's some hardworking caregivers out there trying to make sure those kids are staying on the right path. Okay, so another strategic priority is strengthening the network. Um, what do you mean by that? So we work with this fantastic group of partners, including our thousand local food shelves and meal programs, shelters, and uh, we want to make sure we're continuing to help them. They need to be ready to be able to do more perishable foods, not just us yeah. to be able to support <laughs> that. Uh, they want support on their training, the recipes that you just mentioned. So there's a lot we can be doing with uh, with them in terms of investing in our partnership for the entire system's benefit. Yeah, and that's that's the big, broad community of what is Second Harvest. Right, That's and right. What, representing all of the different things that you do with all of the different community members, because there are many of them. Exactly. Right? Okay. Well, when we come back from break, we're going to continue this conversation and talk some more about the bonding bill in particular, what you're looking for, you know, what these dates are, and you have an event coming up next week. We do. Yes, you do. Second, second harvest. Day on the hill, you know, and it's, you know, that's a time for you to show up, right? Because we need people to show up. So let's talk about that when we come back on the other side of this break. I'm with Rob Zeski, who's the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland.
Okay, here we go. When I find myself in times of trouble, oh, you know what? I didn't. Yep. I had your mics in queue, not on air. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try it again. Okay. <laughs> You're coming through the board, but not on the uh, yeah, recording. Yeah. I can hear not hear me in my ears, which is sometimes scary. Hello. <laughs> what do I sound like? I don't know. <laughs> right, okay, here we go again. Okay. Welcome back to Food Freedom Radio, where we plant the seeds of change. I'm Karen Olson Johnson. Laura Headland will be joining us again next week. I'm with Rob Zeski today, the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland. And just a few statistics to remind us about hunger. Um, half a million people are fed a year through Second Harvest. Um, one in 10 seniors still struggle to find food every day. Volunteers. 100,000 hours per year. 94% of every donation goes directly to programs and 80 million meals served a year. 60% of that food is fresh. And if you don't think after hearing that, the Second Harvest Heartland has profound impact, boy, I don't know. And <laughs> and I know it does because I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. And coming up on May 9th is Second Harvest Heartland's Day on the Hill. And, boy, that's exciting. At 1 o'clock, there's going to be a rally, right, Rob? We are going to take the Capitol, absolutely. Yeah. Make, sure our, <laughs> make sure our legislators and leaders know um, that, you know, this is, this is so often a, a quiet issue, right? I mean, this oh. is one that is... It hides uh, in the shadows. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it has so much stigma associated with it, right? This, for many people, is uh, is the opposite of the American dream, and that's not right. But I think that's how many of our our neighbors feel, and that's part of the narrative at a at a national level, federal level, sometimes with uh, with our uh, our conversation around uh, around hunger. But this is one we've got to raise up. It, you know, I, I used to think that when I started this job, I, I thought it was going to take a, a moonshot, right? I mean, this was a JFK moonshot yeah. moment, right, for us. Um, and ten years of doing this, I've I've discovered that this problem just isn't that hard, right? This is a simple problem, and we've cast this, I think, in many ways, as Minnesota's largest solvable problem, right? When I think about other issues, this should be one of the easier ones. Um, we want to make sure that our legislators know that, that this does not have to be tolerated here. For not that extra much money, we could be able to live in a world without hunger. And I hope we can instill the imagination of our legislators, the imagination of our donors and our partners and our volunteers, um, because if if not in Minnesota, I, I don't know where. Right? You are an optimist, aren't you? Uh, I, I am. I, and I'd love to believe mostly a realist. I'm a math guy. You know, we can show you in the back of an envelope <laughs> that it doesn't take that much money to in the, in the grand scheme of problems to feed our neighbors. Uh, and so this is one we got to make sure we don't lose uh, the imagination of how we can uh, live in a community that doesn't have to have people who worry where the next meal is going to come from. And the simplicity of this is that you have the facility. Okay, you're ready to go with that facility. You need $18 million from the state of Minnesota. Um, and dare I say, you know, you're not asking for a stadium. You're not asking for whatever. You're asking for $18 million commitment. And what's the donation commitment that comes in on the other side of that? Yeah, so it, it's going to be uh, $32 million, So we'll match almost two to one for the campaign itself. And then $125 million a year uh, is what the community contributes in food, in funds to make us go. And, you know, you mentioned the stadiums, too. I, I will tell you, this is not an organization. Second Harvest Heartland does not sell tickets. We do not have an admission fee. There is no rent. We essentially, you know, give this food away. We have some shipping and, you know, kind of receiving costs that we do with our agencies. It's typically 
pennies on a pound of fresh food. And so yeah. it is, uh, we don't have other revenue sources and our community doesn't want us to. Uh, we're mm -hmm. a community driven organization, but it's really critical that the state steps up right now. Yeah, because this and, and the expansion of this is an expansion based on need. It's not based on, oh, we'd like a new building. Right. It's based on need and based on this having potential access to a whole lot of food, but not having the facility or, you know, the the square footage to deal with what you need to deal with to get that food where it can be can be utilized. Yep, yep. It, and, and I guess I would say you're right. It is need. There is need that's unmet, but there's also opportunity, right? It's not uh, it's not need without resources. And as I mentioned, 200 million pounds of food that's grown in Minnesota that doesn't make it to markets every year. And that's the edible stuff. We know we can also get after it. We've got the resources to be able to do it. And I think that's the exciting marriage between our abundance and, and our need. Well, and I'm going to say, having observed it firsthand, a well-oiled machine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> And so, you know, if you can, if you like this, 94% of every donation goes directly to programs. You have mechanized this to the point where it is, it's, it's just amazing how wonderful it operates. But it, but it operates with a very human, compassionate component as well. Every person that walks in that door, they're not a number. They're not a box. They're a person who has a, a particular need that Second Harvest exists to, to assist with. That's right. Efficiency is very important to us, but that's not our why, right? That's not our uh -uh. reason. Our reason is every penny we save, we can put into more food, right? Into better service uh, of, of the clients that we serve. So there's no doubt about uh, what really motivates us. So May 9th is the day on the Hill. The rally's at 1 o'clock. If they want to find out the agenda, where can they go? Yeah, uh, toharvest.org is our website. And so we'll have information about that uh, on, on the website. We are inviting people to join us for a rally. So we've got uh, several guest speakers. We're going to be having leaders that will be there to provide uh, some comments. But then we're also hooking people up with their legislators that day. Uh, so if you want to visit and schedule some time with your legislator, if you're a con constituent, uh, to be able to talk and, and make sure that this is on the radar of uh, of the people who are going to be choosing uh, choosing the bonding committee, the bonding bills. And a sign that says "End Childhood Hunger," right? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> or senior hunger, or, or hunger end. within you know within communities. What I think bring your passion uh, to this conversation for sure, because we all I think learned over the course of two thousand and eight nine. We, we just weren't many degrees of separation from somebody who needed help, right? We, and, and in the words of one of our longtime donors, she said, I'm, you know, we're all just a head injury away from needing support like this. Our lives can change so quickly. And uh, for those people that we serve, they are by and large trying to do all the right things and, and just haven't been able to. And so bring that compassion, bring your own story, bring your own connection to this you know, issue. Yeah, and I'm going to say, to, you know, there before the grace of God go I, mm -hmm. right? And, and that being able to stand in somebody else's shoes and do what you can do in order to, to show that empathy could be as simple as a call to your legislator, could be as simple as showing up at this rally. It could be, you know, there's many different ways to help, right? Absolutely. And so whether that's, whether that's on May 9th, as you said, a legislative call, that can be volunteering with us or any food shelf. That could be uh, getting engaged and, and schooled on the farm bill conversations that will be coming up uh, right now nationally that will affect our hungry neighbors. There are lots of ways, uh, and we hope people get... Get smart and get engaged. Get smart and get engaged. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, again, Rob Zesky, who is the CEO of Second Harvest Heartland. The, the website again, Rob? Is 2Harvest. That's the number 2, harvest.org. Okay. And on that website, what will they find? Opportunities to engage as a volunteer, interest in uh, the May 9th event. We also have uh, ways to host a food or fun drive in your workplace, as well as a ton of educational information about the issue of hunger here in Minnesota. And if you're food insecure yourself, what will they find on the website? They will find links to get, uh, to get some food. To get some food, because that's what it's about. It's about us doing all of this work together, right? Absolutely. So May 9th, 1 o'clock. Second Harvest Day on the Hill. Go to the website, toharvest.org. .org. It's just, this is an economic issue. It's a statewide issue, but we can solve it. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. They, the, you're listening to Food Freedom Radio on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Cool. Got it. Bam.